status you are uh, already recording okay great so we can uh, start again the next speaker is uh, laurent friedel from uh, perimeter institute and uh, he will talk about uh, uh, local holography um, a new um, a new paradigm for quantum gravity laurent you can uh, start whenever you're ready okay uh, you can hear me well, I guess. So let me start. Yeah, I want to talk about. Um, well, first, you know, I'm really sorry, like everybody, to not be able to be in Corfu right now in person. I hope uh, next year we can enjoy that. Um, so I want to present uh, a new framework, a new paradigm uh, for quantum gravity, which has uh, been developed in the past five years, and it's, you know, going to be more developed in the in the country in the following future. Um, some of the key uh, uh, person uh, I worked with on these uh, ideas are William Delaney, Farouche, Roberto Oliveri, and especially Daniele Pranzetti in the, in the past uh, years here. So this is a list of collaborators which are, without which I could not have done that. Um, so the, the fundamental questions I want to focus are, are twofold. The first one is, you know, what are the fundamental degrees of freedom in quantum gravity. Uh, another way to ask it is, what are this geometrical entropy or area counting? And a related question is, what are the fundamental symmetries of nature? So, uh, you know, associated with this question, we can, you know, the old strategy is to make wild Planckian guesses that these are strings or loops or causal brains or non-commutative geometry or, or whatnot. Uh, what I want to propose is that we should start instead uh, to use the information about uh, uh, symmetries that we have in the semi-classical theory to help us guide us in, into what are these you know, fundamental degrees of freedom instead of jumping around, uh, trying to be Planckian from, from the start. And the new perspective I'm going to talk about uh, comes from uh, first asking new fundamental questions. Uh, the, the first one is really, what is the nature of entanglement across subregion that follows from gravity dynamics? And the second one is developing new technical tools. So covariant phase space is, is really a very important and central aspect of, of how we, we can understand the nature of symmetry in a you know, background independent manner, if you want. And also developing the theory of coagent orbits for infinite dimensional symmetry group is a very important technical aspects that uh, people are developing right now. And the new principle, and the idea is that we have to follow a new principle, and that's the, the, the principle of local holography. So holography is not a new principle, but um, for people who are not versed into that it could be confusing because there are several notions of holography. So the most popular one is ADS-CFT holography, in ADS-CFT, in this holography, the boundary is usually asymptotic and time-like. Now, this boundary is rigidly defined by a boundary condition, which means that it does not allow outgoing radiation. That's very important. In ADS-CFT, you cannot treat outgoing radiation, which is the nature of gravity. And because there's no outgoing radiation, the system is closed and it is unitary by design. So unitarity is built in this very hard boundary condition. Something which is more interesting for me as, as somebody thinking about quantum gravity is celestial holography. In that case, the boundary is asymptotic still uh, uh, and null, but now it's not rigidly defined by, by boundary condition, but just less rigidly by fall off condition that allow the, the boundary geometry or the boundary data to fluctuate. And therefore it allows radiation, it allows time dependent. And, and there's a lot of challenges, technical challenges associated with that because it means that now the system is open and allow energy loss. So we need to be able to understand how to quantize a system, uh, uh, an open system. And that's really the, the, the foundations of the, of the problem of quantum gravity. Now, uh, what I want to talk about is local holography, which is, uh, goes one step deeper uh, um, in the sense that it doesn't really require any choice of boundary condition. We try to relax all possible boundary conditions. And it, it, what it requires is a choice of a Cauchy domain attached to a finite corner, a finite surface. Uh, now, each holography is associated with a symmetry group uh, for ADS-CFT is the conformal symmetry group. Uh, for celestial holography is the celestial, you know, generalized BMS symmetry group, which contains, of course, co conformal symmetry group. And for local holography, it is the corner symmetry group, which contains generalized BMS and therefore contains conformal also. Uh, uh, so the, the deeper you go into this holography, the, the more symmetries you have. So the main reason why you have holographic gravity is very 
simple and very profound. It's simply that the symmetry charge in gravity uh, are constraints. And therefore, it means that if you compute the symmetry charge uh, associated with the region sigma, uh, uh, they are supported on co-dimension two corners, S. And S is going to be the entangling sphere here. So this is a slice sigma, and then you have a time evolution and in its domain of dependence, and it's attached to a, 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 an entangling sphere here. And this is the sphere that controls essentially uh, 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 you know, the entirety of the symmetry algebra. So now what it means is that at the quantum level, we, we expect that uh, first we, we, you know, uh, we expect to assign a corner symmetry algebra uh, GS to the boundary, to this corner here. And then uh, every uh, observable you're going to compute have to transform uh, as a representation of this corner symmetry algebra. Uh, what it also means is that the representations of this symmetry algebra provides a basis for the Hilbert space associated with finite regions. Uh, uh, and essentially it means that you know, the Hilbert space of with sigma is going to decompose in the sum of irrepresentation, irreducible representations of this corner symmetry group, uh, uh, which you can think of as generalization of super select, gravitational super selection sector, or as we will see, non radiative space times. Uh, so geometry is encoded algebraically, you know, uh, 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 that's the main theme of this local holography, you know, uh, and what we need to do to do that, and that's the goal, is that we want to go from a ge geometrical picture to an algebraic picture. And one of, one of the two things we need to do is first identify what is this symmetry group and what are its representations. Um, so the, 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 the first aspect of this uh, symmetry group is, is that it controls completely the nature of entanglement across subregions and the subregion entanglement. So what happens is that if you assume that we can you decompose our you know, slice into a subregion sigma and it's composed on sigma bar with an interface, which is S, then we want to understand how the Hilbert space of the theory uh, decompose. So in non-relativistic quantum field theory, there's, you know, there's no entanglement, which means two things. First, the Hilbert space decompose a, a, into a tensor product. And second, the, the, the sub factors here are orthogon. Okay. Now in massive relativistic quantum field theory, it's more interesting. Uh, we still have that the totally but space decomposed into a tensor product. So in, in that sense, the theory is local, but you know, now these uh, subfactors are, are not orthogonal to each other. And that's uh, uh, the, the, the source of, if you want, Hawking radiation and vacuum entanglement uh, 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 there. It's the fundamental entanglement of subregions uh, uh, due to the non-orthogonality of the tensor factor. Okay, but that's, that's uh, usual field theory. Now, if we, if we go to gravity, or in fact, in general, gauge theories, there's something deeper that's happening, is that in gauge theories, gravity included, the total inverse space do not you know, decompose, or does not decompose into a tensor product. Uh, uh, um, so it means that the tensor product of local operators with sigma and sigma bar is not enough to reconstruct the full inverse space. And this is due to the fact that now, there's an infinite number of, of vacuum uh, states that, that arise that, there in this context. It's also due to the fact that, you know, the states which are missing are, are, are due to the fact that we, we have non-local observables due to the gauge environments. Uh, so how do we accommodate that? Uh, well, the way out is that we have to understand that Hilbert space not only carry bulk states, but also boundary states. Uh, and we have to introduce this uh, boundary Hilbert space, which is the Hilbert space of edge modes. Uh, and this Hilbert space, the way it's uh, understood and, and represented is that it has to carry a representation of the uh, uh, corner symmetry group, uh, GS, a symmetry group, which is attached to any surface. Uh, then once you have such an extension of uh, uh, Hilbert space attached to subregion, you can define uh, a fusion product, which is not a tensor product. Essentially, you take the tensor product of these uh, objects and you, you fuse the states by demanding that it form, they form a singlet under the representation. So of course, when you fuse this representation, you always, you know, in some sense, in a singlet state and, and the, uh, the representation appears only when you cut out space times there. So this is what uh, uh, you know, we, we showed in 2016 with William there. So what it means is that the corner symmetry group and its representation is an absolutely necessary ingredient to construct space time. And it, you cannot avoid it. No matter what is your theory of quantum gravity, you have to tell me 
you know, uh, um, this, this symmetry group and, and, and study their representation. So uh, this is what I, we call the corner symmetry. Corner, of course, because it's attached to co-dimension two uh, uh, spheres and not, uh, not uh, hypersurfaces. Uh, and the question is, what is the group for gravity? What representations appear and, and what do we conclude from it? So this is what I want to now present um, uh, in the remaining part of the talk. Okay, so what is the group uh, uh, that you know, appear from the many studies that have uh, been done um, about it? Uh, uh, we now have a, a pretty uh, good understanding of, of the group, uh, uh, which is in fact a, a universal group. This group is the same group, no matter if you work with Einstein gravity or any higher derivative theory. So in fact, it's a group that completely is the same uh, uh, or is stable under renormalization. And that's, what, that's the key. The key is that you, you want to understand quantum gravity as not something that changes if you change the cutoff or the scale, or, but something which is, which is organized uh, uh, as representation states of this uh, uh, corner symmetry group. So the structure, it's a, uh, uh, the structure of a semi-direct product where the core of, uh, of the, uh, the thing, you know, think of it as a semi-direct product as point carré. So this would be the Lorentz part and the translation part, if you want. So the analog of the Lorentz part now is the diffeomorphism symmetry of the sphere. Okay, and uh, the semi-direct factor, the normal subgroup, uh, is the space of function valued into uh, some semi-simple Lie group. So what are these semi-simple Lie group? The most important factor is is this uh, uh, boost factor SL2R orthogonal. Which uh, uh, you know contains all the boosts you can you can make around that sphere, and this is essentially this is where the the entropy of black hole lies. It's just uh, one of these SL to R sector that preserve the null horizon, for instance. But there could be other factors which are SL to R due to some kind of a duality. If you want, if you think of this one as some kind of electric SL to R, this would be some kind of magnetic SL to R. So this can be turned on and off depending on the choice of theta-like parameters in gravity, which are called Mirzi parameter. And this one is more like a gauge uh, uh, factor, which is natural if you work in first order from mechanism, which is essentially the local Lorentz symmetry. Um, okay, so maybe, you know, it's new to some of you what these groups are. The key point is that these are simple groups. So they all have Casimirs here. And, and the, essence, the essence of gravity is in the fact that a priori, you know, for a general theory, you could have different Casimirs appearing for different uh, of these uh, normal factor. Here, the beauty is that all of these Casimirs are essentially proportional to the area form square. Okay, so it means that the area form is, uh, 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 in fact, the defining, if you want, object uh, uh, for your quantum representation. It also means that the total area is one of the Casimirs uh, uh, of the symmetry algebra. So that, that kind of inform, if you want, the fact that uh, maybe, you know, you can, it's a first step. It's not a justification, but it means that when you say that the entropy is proportional to the area, well, it's, you know, more general way to say that is that the entropy has to be proportional to the Casimirs of the representation you studied, of course, and, and the area is one of them. Uh, in, so one result that we have proven recently is that if you turn on the immediate parameter, which is a theta-like parameter for gravity, then uh, uh, you can get uh, a proof in the continuum of area quantization, which is really the first time it appears, not you know, with any extra assumption, but from first principle. And, and the idea is to wonder, okay, now that I have this SL2R factor here, uh, when, when I represent them, I have to choose unitary representations, and there's really two series of unitary representations, continuum or discrete. And so you have to understand which one of these representations are, 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 are engaged uh, uh, when, when you quantize. And it turns out that uh, if the image parameter, which is called here gamma is not zero, then you, know, you have to choose discrete representations. And it means that uh, at the quantum level, uh, when you're going to choose the representation of this group, you have you know, uh, to uh, uh, you know, impose, if you want, a discrete series of representation of a set to R at each point of the sphere, which essentially means that the, the area form is not a, a, a continuous Lebesgue measure, if you want, but it's a, it's a discrete uh, singular measure uh, where you, know, you have a sum of punctures and there's a Casimir attached to each punctures. Um, and as I say, this is a really a universal result. Uh, 
Um, so that's what the group is about. Now, what are the representations of this group? And of course, you know, think about this group as uh, somehow the conformal group for a 2D system. This is a 4D system. The, the understanding the theory of representation is really something that is going to be developed more in the, in the next four to five years, we, we are, but we have started it. And what we realize is that um, the symmetry group I'm talking about, this, this uh, diff S times uh, uh, local normal uh, subgroups are in fact, were very, very well studied in the, in the literature uh, uh, because these are the symmetry group of two dimensional hydrodynamics. And, and in this analogy, so you can think of it that, uh, you know, gravity uh, in the membrane paradigm, if you want picture that gravity creates a fluid on this, this sphere, then in this analogy, the area density exactly plays the role of the fluid density. And therefore, when you have area quantization, as I was saying there, it's exactly the same as, as uh, you know, going from thermodynamics to statistical mechanics when you start to have a constituent picture. Okay, so uh, uh, area quantization means that uh, this gravitational fluid, if you want to take this analogy seriously, which carries the representation uh, as constituents. And now we can classify all the Casimirs of this uh, uh, um, group uh, um, in the same way that we can understand the, the, represent, you know, the, the dynamics of perfect fluids. And the, the, the Casimirs are in some sense the concept quantities of the perfect fluid. The, Gravity equations of motions are, are fluid-like equations of motion that was known uh, for a long while. Uh, and it means that the Casimirs are associated with the Ernst trophy. And for those of you who don't know, the Ernst trophy are the moment of the fluid vorticity. So when you have a fluid that has a momenta, you can take the vorticity of this momenta, which is like in 2D, just the, the momenta is a one form, the vorticity is a two form, and then you can take moments of this. And this, this completely characterizes the, the, the Casimirs. And this result comes by understanding that the representations of this uh, semi-direct product group are classified uh, uh, like any semi-direct product representation by representation of the little group, the group that preserves the, the fundamental area form. And it means that this little group is the group of area preserving deformorphisms. And for people who are well versed in non-commutative geometry and fuzzy sphere, we know that there's a fuzzy sphere analog of area preserving deformorphism, which is UN symmetry. And so that opens a, a completely new way to think about regularizing or quantizing this, uh, this corner symmetry. Uh, okay, what do we conclude from it? So, you know, I established there's a corner symmetry group, there's a, a fluid like uh, picture of their theory of representation, but what does it mean? And, and what you have to understand is that uh, the fact that this is corner symmetry group is really a statement about the nature of uh, the space-time metric commutation relation. So, you know, we're doing quantum gravity, which means that the metric is part of the phase space, and you have to understand uh, how do they commute with each other, right? So here, it's a presentation of a metric which adapted to a, a given sphere. So the sigma a are the, are the coordinate along the sphere, x, x1, x2, or x0, x1 are the coordinates, you know, transverse. The normal coordinate, right? Here, you know the two null coordinate, if you want. And of course, the metric decomposes uh, in in an ADM version, if you want, where you know the, there's a normal metric here, uh, there's a tangential metric, and then there's a, a generalized lapse and shift. And and what you can prove is that the charges that generate deformorphisms are really due to non-commutation relations of these lapses. Um, you can also prove that the boost uh, symmetry generator is the one that uh, you know, includes the entropy calculation is really related to this normal metric. So uh, essentially this, is, this, this normal metric, there's really three independent components uh, up to a conformal factor. And these are these three that form this SL2R. And it's the same uh, uh, um, conclusion from that. Uh, if the energy parameter is not present, the metric uh, is, is commutative, so there's no non-commutative geometry in the sphere. But if you turn on the image parameter, then QEB becomes non-commutative. And what it means is that when you understand the quantization of geometry, you are understanding the quantization of, of geometry. And now, instead of talking about geometry, you can talk about algebra on that side. And that gives you a seamless a way to go from classical to quantum. The, the last part of the, of the results that we are now establishing is the connection with this field of uh, celestial holography, which uh, you, as you may have followed or not, there's been a, a lots of new understanding about uh, 
you know, celestial uh, holography is about finding out what are the symmetry of the S matrix uh, in flat space. And, and what we can show uh, and what we have shown is that uh, in asymptotically flat space time, and if you take the limit where the sphere area goes to infinity, you can show that the corner symmetry group reduces to the group of symmetry of the S matrix, which is called the, the generalized BMS group or BMSW group. So it's BMS. Uh, uh, Generalized means that you generalize transformations to diff S and, and W means that you also include vile transformation. And the BMSW group, which is the group of celestial holography uh, is a subgroup of the corner symmetry group. And it's the subgroup that preserves the asymptotic null generator. So now it's very well understood that, you know, if you take a, a, a large sphere in some sense, you reduce your symmetry group because you put more structure into it. And, and you recover this celestial holography uh, S matrix symmetry group. Uh, there's more, of course, to be understood in this connection. And oh, the in this Sorry? Can we hear? So in this limit, the corner symmetry charges becomes the soft charges. And it's something important to appreciate is that if you, if you do asymptotic holography, you are never, absolutely never going to understand the non-perturbative feature of quantization because uh, um, the commutators are proportional to the inverse of the area. So taking, taking the area to infinity is in fact the same as taking a semi-classical limit. And any fundamental uh, quantization of geometry such that uh, the, the area gap is lost. So it, it, you know, it tells you that in some sense, if you work purely from the, the point of view of infinity, you can gather a lot of information, but it is a perturbative limit. Uh, so you have to go uh, inside. Uh, that's uh, not optional, in my view. Now, uh, the latest part is uh, something we recently understood is, is uh, a more precise description of the, uh, these asymptotic charges uh, um, and how they, they really function and how they describe the symmetry group. So uh, what happens is that you can, you know, there's been a lot of literature on understanding what is the asymptotic phase space of, of gravity. Okay, the phase space that describes what happened at LIGO or any you know, uh, gravitational events. And it is well known that this gravitational phase space splits between uh, uh, the radiation, because radiation is present, things are, are changing in time. You know, we are not in uh, ADS-CFT holography where we froze the radiation, we are allowing radiation to happen, which are called the hard modes and the soft part of, 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 uh, uh, of the phase space, which are the soft charges. And so in gravity, one way to describe the degrees of freedom covariantly is to label them by the vile scalar, psi, you know, psi zero to psi four. And there's a famous peeling theorem that says that the vile scalar, you know, asymptotically they, they go like that. So the different vile scalar peels uh, 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 in, in different uh, powers when you send R to infinity. And, and the dominant power here uh, represents radiations. Okay, so this is uh, something that people call the news at the time derivative of the news. This is where the radiation is. And all the other ones uh, represent the soft charge. Uh, and each of these soft charges, so usually in, in asymptotia, people put psi three to zero. It's not clear to me why it's justified, but if you do that, then you're only left with three uh, charges. And, and this one generates the super translation. And uh, anytime you have a symmetry, you have a corresponding uh, a memory effect and the soft theorem. So the, the super translation is the leading uh, memory effect and leading soft theorem. The second one is the super rotation, the diff S component, which is sub leading. And we just uh, recently proved that, uh, or it's going to appear soon that this one in fact represents the, the spin two generator, uh, which is sub leading. So overall we have a, the, the symmetry contains a higher spin symmetry. Uh, now we can classify entirely the non-radiative vacua by imposing psi four to zero and, and, and understand, you know, uh, each, each non-radiative vacua correspond to an instanton, if you want, a, a non-perturbative solution of gravity. Uh, uh, and at the quantum level, any non-radiative vacua is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a, a irreducible representation of the asymptotic symmetry group. Okay, so understanding the Casimir of the asymptotic symmetry group, the same thing as classify all possible quantum uh, uh, configuration. And now a general space time can be uh, containing radiation, can be uh, reconstructed from impulsive waves. So an impulsive wave would be is something where you have a, a vacuum, non it's not a vacuum, it's a non radiative space time here, another non radiative space time, and then there's a 
there's a creation of psi four, you know, along a, a null plane here, um, and and uh, this uh, non-perturbative uh, these represent non-perturbative solutions. It's uh, it's valid in all order in G Newton. Remember, these are very these impulsive waves are very it's our basis of perturbation of infinity, which are fully non-perturbative. They are not uh, like graviton. And at the quantum level, it means that we can understand this uh, uh, radiative space-time as intertwiners, uh, which between fundamental uh, representations. So this is a completely new way to think about quantum space-time, even from the point of view of infinity. And here is my summary. Um, so I know it's been, you know, I haven't given you any details because there's a lot of moving parts that have been put together, but the picture uh, I think is, quite compelling, at least for me. Uh, what I said in this talk is that at, at its core, local holography is simply a more profound expression of another theorem for gravitational theory. So we just accept the, 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 the profoundness of the not a second theorem. Uh, what it means is that it implies the presence of non-commutative algebras uh, associated with subregions. And this non-commutative algebras represents uh, a quantization of geometry uh, in a very precise manner. Uh, we can obtain discretization of space, not by putting some ad hoc color for ansatz, but clearly from the continuum and from the quantization of this uh, represent of this uh, of this uh, symmetry group. Um, now, as I said, any physical observable uh, inside the region, such as the density matrix, the correlation functions organized according to the representation theory of this symmetry group. There is even evidence that if you have the, the maximal symmetry group, the symmetry group might be even enough to completely characterize the nature of the correlation function. Like into the CFT, all you need to specify is the spectra of primaries, and then the rest is taken care of. Um, now, for this audience, something that might be interesting is the fact that th there's a central role played by area preserving diffeomorphisms. Uh, uh, and this suggests that uh, there might be a covariant regularization of this uh, theory, which involve uh, fuzzy spheres and uh, matrix model. And uh, thank you. Thanks, Laurent, for the very last talk. Are there questions? Um, I don't see anyone in Corfu, but I see an attendee who wants to ask a question, Fedele. Uh, yes, the question uh, is, uh, uh, you're essentially bosonic here. If you were on the spin bundle with just uh, more indices, uh, more complication, or you think you can gain something? In general, the geometry of the spin bundle is richer, but not necessarily. You mean, you mean including uh, fermions in the game? Including fermions, yes. So instead of uh, the space time, you are on the spin bundle and... Uh... Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you could do that. Uh, that is, if you were dealing with supergravity. Um, I, I don't really need to do that at this, at this stage okay. because the, the, the already the, the, normal bundle the, two, the normal bundle of, an, uh, of a two sphere is very, very rich and, and not completely understood at this stage. So like, for instance, the presence of not charge, there's a notion of magnetic, uh, gravitational charge, there's, a, there's some kind of uh, dionic excitations, all of that is, is still in flux. So there's, I think there's a lot to, to do. Uh, now, you're right, if you want, you could also kind of supersymmetry. No, it's, the, the, the point is that in general, the geometry of the steam bundle with the Dirac operator rather than the Lassian uh, yeah. is, is richer. Also the fuzzy sphere, if you look at it with the spin, with, with another matrix, it becomes a richer object, but oh, sure, sure, sure. So you're not, asking, yeah, so, so I don't want to do. I am not suggesting to do super gravity or or something. But the geometry of uh, with spin often in non-commutative geometry, which is spectral, becomes richer. Not necessarily. It's uh, is more complicated. So I just wonder. Well, in, whether fact, in fact, I have to ask yourself the question and. Yeah. No, in fact, you have to understand that because we're talking about gravity. So there's spin one, there's spin zero excitation, but there's spin one, there's spin two. So you, you, okay, you could, you could also include spin one half. But in fact, you have to understand. So the the, the bundle, the, the bundle structure yeah, is still yeah, there. Yeah, the anyway. structure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. 
Yeah, Thank but you. when I was mentioning fuzzy sphere, it's more like a conjecture. It's like it's the first time, if you want, that from a covariant theory, you see that there's a place without breaking the symmetry to maybe introduce such a structure that is compatible with with diffeomorphism symmetry. That's what I'm, you know. Now, there's a lot of work to to uh, go beyond to to show that. But yeah, yeah. The, anyway. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Laurent, have you thought about the sitter space there, at all? There was another question by uh, Chris Somalakis. Okay. Maybe. Um, Thank you. Okay, well, I can answer your question. So, so here, you know, what what we really have under under control is these finite spheres and and let's say certain limits. So, a limit towards uh, um, asymptotically flat space time is under control now. I mean, to some extent, because there was a lot of work done, you know, by by people on celestial holography that allowed us to understand the nature of, of symmetry. There's, very, there's a little bit of work um, uh, on the limit towards, let's say, ADS space. But the thing is that, you know, the limit you get is, is a limit which allows radiation, which is not part of the usual ADS law, ADS CFT law. So this goes beyond whatever people know. And then, as you're saying, it becomes even more confusing if you try to, to do that. But a priori, the beauty is the universality of that structure, right? So, uh, um, I mean, there's a lot of technical details that matter in terms of how the asymptotic uh, uh, symmetry mix, for instance, something which which is which is nice when you go to uh, something like flat infinity is that there's a complex structure on the sphere and it kind of it kind of splits naturally, and and it's it's harder if you have a cosmological constant. But people have started to look at at uh, at uh, asymptotic uh, de Sitter and asymptotic anti de Sitter allowing for the first time radiation. Yeah, going beyond naive holography. Where thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's you know it's a teamwork. Everybody can look at it from different perspectives. The goal is that we 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 merge in the, in the middle. Thanks. Chris O'Malley said the question. Alicia, he said that uh, he had no uh, audio. Yeah. Yeah, Alicia, he has no audio. Can you? Hello. Uh, okay, there seems to be a problem with connection. Uh, yeah, I cannot hear. Uh, yeah. There is a least. problem with interconnection in core. For the meantime, you can continue with question Laurent for a couple of minutes. And, Hi, uh, it's Messia here. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, there is a problem here with the network someone is trying to solve. Um, in the meantime, are there still uh, um, other questions to Laurent? But there was one by Chris Malis. Can you allow him to? Um, Travis has uh, to okay. unmute uh, uh, Chris. Uh, yes, but I'm not uh, a host, so uh, I cannot do that. Uh, yes, Travis has to do it. Another person. Uh, yes, but he has problem with the internet. Oh, okay, I understand. I understand. Uh, but maybe in the meantime. Uh, I, yes, I was the there until can, recently. Uh, I was there, I was an organizer, I was there until today morning, and uh, there is one heroic student of uh, George wow. that does the things, and if things don't go well, then uh, he's only one. Well, maybe, uh, okay, maybe, maybe I can, uh, wait, wait. Chris, can you uh, ask in the uh, chat? I can now, okay, I can uh, now do that. Okay. Uh, so, Chris, so, Manis? Can you hear me now? Can yes. you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now, yeah. Ah, uh, Lorana was uh, intrigued by this appearance of uh, volume preserving diffeomorphisms uh, in, uh, well, it's area preserving. Uh, it's an exceptional group, if I remember correctly, because it's the only one that is uh, infinite diameter. Uh, so uh, if you have diffeos on, on, a, uh, on a Riemannian manifold, uh, if I give you a, a diffeo, so I give you the initial position of all the points and I give you the final position. Then you can ask yourself what's the closest uh, uh, 
uh, what's the shortest path to take uh, between the two, namely, uh, what's the path that uh, such that the average distance traveled by points is the shortest possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in this way, the, the metric on the manifold induces a metric on the diffeomorphism group. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I give you a curve in the diffeomorphism group, uh, you just look at the points moving on the manifold, you compute the average distance traveled by those points, and uh, that gives you the length of the curve in the group. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in two dimensions, uh, there are diffeos which are infinitely far away from uh, the identity. Mm -hmm. And that's the only number of dimensions where this happens. Yeah, yeah. No, that no, makes it's, the, yeah. Uh, very uh, special and uh, very hard to deal with, actually. Uh, I was wondering. Yeah. Okay, so it's not a question, it's just a remark that. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. So let, let me maybe add to your remark. No, it, it's very remarkable when you look at it from the point of a symmetry, like four dimensional is very, very, very special. There's, it's only in 4D that there's all this conjunction of beautiful, rich structure, that you have a complex structure, that the area preserving uh, diffeomorphism group is very special in 2D. And in fact, there's been a lot of study, it's quantizable, and, 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 and we understand very much, very well, it's the theory of representation. There's a complete classifications of representation theory. In our dimension, it's much more uh, featureless in some sense. Yes. Um, yes. Now, a beautiful result, maybe this is the one you're referring to, is that Mathematicians have studied the geodesic motion of, of uh, the area preserving equations of motion. And there's a beautiful result of Arnold that shows that the equations of geodesic motion uh, 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 of that group is the Euler equation. So that is the yeah. incompressible fluid equation. So this is the sure. connection between the geometry of groups and, and fluid mechanics. And the fact that it appears again in gravity is kind of remarkable. And then the last thing which is remarkable is that we know that there is a proposed quantization of area preserving diffeomorphism as UN symmetry group. Uh -huh. right? Interesting. If, we, if you replace functions on the sphere by, and the proof is goes as follows, you replace functions on the sphere by fuzzy spheres, and then you try to match the, the analog of area preserving symmetry group with the same structure constant or deformation, and you find UN symmetry. Mm -hmm. So, so there is there is something very mysterious and and which suggests that maybe the regularization you were talking about might have to do with with gravity, unlike the Strednicki one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so uh, here we will uh, all continue online. Via <laughs> everyone will uh, follow uh, via its own uh, uh, Zoom. And then we continue with uh, a talk by Jordi Minik, uh, who speaks from the uh, uh, University of Virginia. And uh, he will talk about uh, on the quantum gravity and the quantum gravity phenomenology in the infrared. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, and can you see my slides? I can see your slides. Perhaps you can uh, switch to full screen. Uh, just a second, uh, view and full screen mode. Okay, is that better? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. And uh, um, like Laurent, I'm uh, <clears throat> very sad that I'm not at Corfu, but hopefully next year we'll uh, manage to get there. So this is uh, uh, also talk about uh, quantum gravity and some work that I've been doing with Laurent and Rob for the last seven, eight years, and recently a couple of years with Jerzy Kowalski-Glickman. Um, and uh, But it's a little bit of a different take. We would, of course, like to connect to what Laurent has been doing with other collaborators. Um, uh, and on one side, I, we would also like to connect to, on the other side, we'd like to connect to follow-up phenomenology. And recently we had a paper, the four of us, <clears throat> on quantum gravity phenomenology in the infrared. It was uh, acknowledged by this Gravitational Research Foundation as their second award. And uh, the interesting thing about this is that usually we think about quantum gravity in the uh, ultraviolet, especially when you think about phenomenology. But here, after the story that I will present uh, to you in the next uh, uh, 25 minutes, uh, we'll find that uh, some very important prominent infrared features. Um, um, I've written a review uh, just before the pandemic uh, uh, for another conference of quantum gravity, but essentially there's around 10 papers with uh, Laurent and uh, uh, Rob Lee 
Um, and then uh, a couple of papers, uh, including the three of us and uh, Jerzy Kowalski Glickman. And there are some new concepts here, like uh, Laurent had some new concepts. We introduced some new concept called bound geometry, modular space time, metastring metaparticles. And in the last couple of years, I've been also trying to apply uh, uh, this uh, take on quantum gravity to actual real astronomical observation uh, involving dark matter and dark energy. And this is with Doug Edmonds, who is an astronomer, Tatsuda Kuchi, my colleague at Virginia Tech, who is a, a particle physics and phenomenologist, and two string theory colleagues, Per Berglund and uh, Tristan Hübsch. So the main message here, in some sense, after all song and dance, is that in some sense we have uh, some uh, uh, form of quantum relativity that uh, you could essentially uh, rethink quantum mechanics from the point of view of quantum space time. This is not how we teach our students in uh, what is written in textbooks. And um, like in special theory relativity, where we uncover new geometry of space time, uh, Minkowski geometry here in the quantum context, we uncover new geometry that we'll try to explain called Born geometry, which is related to a concept introduced, oh, maybe a uh, uh, 11, 12 years ago in the context of quantum gravity called relative locality or observer-dependent locality. And then, of course, if you apply quantum mechanics to uh, another thing that we extremely understand extremely well, uh, foundation of particle physics and Thomas matter physics and effective field theory approaches to cosmology, that's your quantum field theory, then we have a prediction, some new concept, uh, in some sense, a, a remnant of, uh, of uh, 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 strings and non-local, if you want, remnant of strings, which we call metaparticles. And they are associated sort of non-community fields uh, 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 whose quanta uh, these metaparticles are. And then finally, quantum gravity then becomes a sort of um, uh, uh, gravitization, if you want, of the structure. So dynamical quantum space time, and that uh, connects to actually string theory, but in an intrinsically non-commutative chiral and doubled form, a little bit different from double field theory um, uh, because it involves this Born geometry. And in that context, one could talk about dark matter and dark energy. Of course, this is, uh, reminds you uh, of special relativity and its road to a, a classical field theory and, and general relativity, right? So Minkowski geometry have relative simultaneity there, take representations of the Lorentz group, to uh, talk about particles, antiparticles in the context of quantum fields and general is just dynamical uh, uh, space time encoded in Einstein's equations. So one of the interesting points here is that we're gonna be working with unitary observables, okay? In the concept of quantum mechanics. And this is just an elementary reminder of where these unitary observables comes from. Uh, if you think about <laughs> mechanical analogy, uh, basically you'll find out, right? That if you go from particles which are rays to waves, which are, sort of uh, quantum, if you want Schrodinger waves, you have to exponentiate, right? The classical data, whether it's the action for particles or iconal for, uh, uh, for rays. And essentially you work with things which are exponents of something in the context of quantum mechanics, I times the action over H bar. That's where um, H bar enters. And we sum over all possibilities because um, the action uh, the, the, the action is uh, linear. There's a unitary evolution and associated linear, um, uh, linear equation. The main insight here, which is a little bit different from what we know from our textbook, is that suppose that you started with the path integral uh, uh, defined, let's say, for some classical fields. And remember, for, you know, for these fields, let's say phi of x, maybe the representation of the Lorentz group, x is a classical label. So suppose you lattice-size it. And so if you introduce a lattice, the, uh, the X is now discretized. And now you say like, well, you know, uh, I can study the path integral on my computer, essentially by discretizing the path uh, integral into some uh, horrible sum using Monte Carlo, getting to continuum limit, viralization, et cetera. But actually, if you think about from the quantum point of view, uh, uh, it, every time you have a lattice, in some sense, you should, uh, um, you should also work with a dual lattice. And that is my next point. In quantum theory, we need a lattice L that we started from on the previous slide, and it's dual. And this is a point that is made in uh, solid state physics where it is well known. So suppose I give you some algebra of operators Q and P, and then you exponentiate. Q and P satisfy Heisenberg algebra, but these uh, generators of translations actually on the lattice and the dual lattice, U and V, they can uh, they actually commute, and therefore they're simultaneously diagonalizable. Therefore, you need quantum numbers associated with the lattice and the dual lattice. So you can now actually go to Hermitian observables, and this is what was done by Harono. So instead of looking at the unitaries, you look at the things that are in the exponents, but now you see that you define the modulo 
those uh, parameters of the lattice and the inverse lattice. A for the lattice spacing and the inverse two pi h bar over A. A ultimately will become, the uh, if you want the minimal length, and that's where the G Newton h bar and C will show up. So in principle, uh, this, this is some, some quantum space time. But in general, when Haranov defined it, he was not thinking about space time. He was just thinking about um, uh, these uh, uh, variables that are defined modulo a's and 2 pi h bar of a. And you see the commutator of q modulo q and q modulo p is actually equal to zero, like the commutator of the generators of translations of the lattice and inverse lattice. Now, notice the modulo variable is actually no local. So in our context, when we talk about space time, because we wanted to do the path integral, let's say, over some field theory, uh, and it was a covariant field theory, so the indices were completely covariant, the space time indices, we will have, instead of A, a fundamental length. Module variables also covariant, you see, because of their uh, 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 the commutator, vanishing commutator, we can actually now talk about, let's say, commutators between T modular, T modular E, which is, of course, prohibitive in the context of quantum theory, right? Where basically we say like, well, if we want a Hamiltonian that has a vacuum, if T were not to commute with E, we would not have a vacuum because we could move the energy ad infinitum to minus infinity, right? And uh, therefore, that's why T is a C number, it's a classical number. And then by covariance in quantum field theory, that's why X, Y, Z, and T are taken as classical labels. But here you see there are operators, but they're these modular operators. H bar is the uh, product, of course, of the lattice and uh, let's say the energy or momentum lattice in this context, right? And so the, there is an explicit non-locality here, which was of course uh, already pointed out by Aharonov, and I'm just going to flash it out for you to see. Um, it's a very simple computation, but there is a new take on it. Uh, it's the computation in which you basically look at the Heisenberg equation of motion, bohr heisenberg jordan equations of motion for that translation operator given certain Hamiltonian. And if you give that Hamiltonian, you obviously see that the, there will be a non-local right, difference between values, let's say, a potential at Q plus A and Q divided by A, but A is finite. And if you now uh, reformulate this in terms of this uh, uh, a Harano variables, you find out some discretization, kind of operatorial discretization for these modular variables, right, off of the usual equation motion, but where the parameter, call it R, call it context contextuality parameter, let's say in the context of the double slip experiment, um, um, uh, you see basically that uh, that because of its finiteness, you get this uh, essential non-locality. Now that non-locality would be actually, actually crucial Right, in order, um, uh, it goes into sort of the center uh, uh, of the essence of, of quantum mechanics from this point of view. I will mention it later. Now, coming back to the sort of uh, reformulation quantum theory using this modular uh, variables, in particular modular space time. Note if you had a Q and P that are h bar, which is the Weyl Heisenberg algebra, but the uh, generators U and V are commuting they will uh, uh, constitute the commuting subalgebra by Heisenberg algebra, and that for us represent actual modular space-time. Now, mathematicians know this since the 50s, that the uh, commuting subalgebra by Heisenberg, uh, a non-commuting algebra is a, uh, parameterized by cell dual lattice, lifted to the wild Heisenberg algebra. And the cell dual lattice now will have the lattice and the dual lattice uh, uh, structure, uh, because it's self-dual, it will be naturally associated with uh, uh, phase space, you will see, but it's also lifted back to the fully non commutative algebra. So there are structures associated with this, and that's what constitute Born geometry. Essentially, this uh, symplectic structure will be associated with this commutator, with the uh, sort of, the, it, it will capture the discretized phase space, um, and we will have orthogonal, doubly orthogonal structure because of the lattice and the dual lattice, because the whole structure is a self dual lattice, right? And in order to define the vacuum, because now we're in a lattice size context, we cannot just apply the translation generators on the vacuum, right? We have to take some something which is sort of invariant with respect to the previous two structures, we introduce the double metric. And the interesting observation that we made with Laurent and Rob in one of the papers just devoted to quantum mechanics is that if you take the intersection of these three uh, structures, the triple structure, the, uh, right? You get basically uh, Laurent's type of structure. And so uh, that means that uh, essentially causality is captured even though there is some type of non-local formulation, right, of quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics essentially is non-locality is consistent with causality where the uh, 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 non-locality is captured by fundamental length and fundamental time as it should be in the context of quantum space time. But then there is this causal structure uh, that is consistent with it. 
It's very similar to the you know, two defining postulates of special theory relativity. Now, this induces a relative observer-dependent locality so that it reconciles fundamental length with Lorentz. Because if I were just to give you fundamental length, fundamental time, and I boost with respect to it, right, you would obviously, because of Lorentz construction and, and, and time dilation, you would not get the fundamental length. But if the different observers actually see all right, um, uh, different space times, then everything is consistent. And that's how relative locality observer dependent uh, locality comes in. So different observers probe different space times and there are different slices of this new covariant structure, quantum covariant structure, which we call modular space time, very similar to special relativity. So in the context of this, uh, to sharpen this a little bit, uh, we have sort of uh, kind of an analog of the condensed matter uh, uh, discussion. We have a discrete but covariant phase space, right, with the ion cells. Uh, the commuting modular variables tells you that you can be in the phase space cell, but you see, because the number operators do not commute, let's say horizontally and vertically, right? Uh, that means that you cannot tell in which cell you are. And that is essentially where this known locality uh, comes in. And that essentially is the origin of Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So you see, but the fact that you can be in the cell tells you that you see, that's essentially presumably the origin of the classical locality, because we know that we can do classic, you know, quantum field theory, right, over local uh, 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 space-time variables, classical space-time variables. And I think that's the, uh, uh, that's essentially the origin, the fact that you can be in the phase space-time once you get into some commuting in, in some continuum limit, where you only have, let's say, these horizontal boxes together, so only have a space-time. Modular space-time is essentially discrete covariant phase space, lifted, right, to uh, while Heisenberg algebra. And there is this kind of lattice plus a dual lattice structure. So there is this ODD structure associated with it. This is very analogous to spin. Spin is discrete, but it does not break SO3, right? Due to the superposition principle. Modular space time is also discrete, but it does not break Lorentz. And that's where the superposition comes in and essentially linearity of quantum theory. Now, you can also formalize this in terms of a new polarization, uh, which uh, uh, is actually um, given by the Zach transform. What is a Zach transform? Well, if I give you a Schrodinger uh, polarization on this discrete lattice, and then I do a discrete Fourier transform in terms of the dual variables. So X now is essentially dimensionless uh, space-time variable, and then X tilde is the dual variable so that X, X tilde is equal to one or I, whatever you want, uh, in some appropriate units, then essentially get this kind of doubled uh, 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 phi of X, X tilde, but you see it depends on the parameter. So this is not a Wigner, uh, 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 or if you want um, uh, phase space uh, 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 formulation of quantum mechanics, because that works in the continuum. Here we have uh, still a, a certain uh, uh, discreteness there, but there is a certain relation between them. You can do the inverse uh, Zach transform, and then you find out essentially that if you do an in inverse Zach transform, uh, if you take n goes to zero, you recovering, uh, uh, thus recovering the uh, Schrodinger representation, you see essentially that there is some type of kind of singularity in that lamp. Now, X and X tilde can be represented like this in the last line, where essentially you find out that there is a certain a connection associated right with this polarization and also a non-trivial kind of a Haronobon phase going through those uh, phase cells. So from the modular uh, poly space time, Schrodinger representation is very singular. So we use this double um, uh, uh, a notation where we put X and X tilde together, right? And then we write this Haronobon phases. By the way, Haronobon phases, and um, if you want in the electric case, when you have a spin in electric instead of charge in the magnetic field, a harno cashier phases, I example these modular variables. So we write this sort of quote unquote a bomb if you want vertex operators in a more covariant form, exponent of the symplectic form. And we can also add the phases that are associated, right, um, with the, um, the eta structure with W orthogonal structure when we lift back from the uh, discretized phase space back to the uh, Heisenberg one. Um, uh, uh, Heisenberg algebra. Anyway, so that, that will be sort of a covariant uh, version of this. What do we do when we go to quantum field theory because maybe we want to do phenomenology? Well, of course, the simplest possible way in the usual canonical stories, you take the Schrodinger and you sort of quote unquote check and quantize. You just turn size into operators. So if you quantize that, of course, you have now uh, some quantum field uh, represented by an operator. 
Uh, it's, uh, of course, a different uh, uh, polarization, canonical representation, or um, than the uh, path integral one that captures exactly the same thing. But the interesting thing is that the operator field is still a function of classical space time. Quanta of quantum fields are particles and, of course, antiparticles. All right. And, um, and so uh, we can even write the first quantized formulation of it, which is, of course, um, uh, well known. Now, if we want to a second quantized exact polarization, we would essentially have this um, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, operator that depends naively of x and x tilde, where x and x tilde uh, do not commute. They are i lambda squared, lambda being the uh, fundamental length. And then in principle, we would have to double both the uh, normalization group and the fields. Why would you have to double the fields? Well, think about x's and p's and x tildes and p tildes, where p, p tilde commute. X and X, uh, X and P uh, uh, Heisenberg commutators, X tilde, P tilde, Heisenberg commutators, and X tilde is I lambda square, so it's kind of double Heisenberg structure. Well, if you were to introduce some background field, uh, let's say like the U1 field or just the scalar potential, you will shift this P, uh, P's by phi and P tilde's by phi tilde. So essentially you have also, uh, 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 at least in the, from this background field theory point of view, some type of doubling of the fields. Um, and then, um, okay, so now I don't know why, Let's see, just a second. All right, so there, then we have a first prediction that essentially we have new quanta of this phi and phi tilde, or if you want uh, some covariant version of this. And that is that we have to sort of double the particle that we have, but it's not two particles because we have the symplectic structure uh, uh, that's encoded in this lambda square uh, p, p uh, tilde dot. Uh, term looks kind of like some berry phase term. And then we have the usual Hamiltonian constraint that captures this double metric, p squared plus p tilde squared plus m squared now. And crucially, we have a second constraint, and that will basically make the whole thing unitary and causal from the point of view of this first quantized formulation, which is p p tilde equals mu. So there's a new parameter. So from the uh, point of view of the particle, essentially we have to take mu goes to zero, which allows also p tilde goes to zero, and then we collapse to the ordinary particle. But the statement would be the essentially we always have a particle kind of entangled to some dual particle, particle and energy E and maybe dual particle mu of E, but they formula, they form one object because there's, you see, one um, word line parameter. Now we compute it uh, uh, in that paper with Yershi uh, in a, a called theory of matter particles, the propagator, and you see the propagator looks kind of uh, singular because he has a delta function of that uh, constraint associated with the ODD symmetry, all right? And it captures sort of this uh, double uh, metric um, uh, um, in its structure as well, consistent with unitarity and causality. Um, and if you go to a particular gauge, p tilde equals zero, which could be, for example, relevant cosmological, dark matter, and so forth, I will mention later, you actually get a dispersion relation where you see that there is an infrared correction. So effectively, in that gauge, Effectively, you seem to be breaking Lorentz, but of course, nothing breaks Lorentz here. Everything is covariant. You just pick the particular grade. It's kind of like going to like engage in the usual uh, uh, discussion of uh, uh, covariant uh, quantum field theory. And you see, basically, you get this effect associated with mu, and mu goes as at, uh, of energy squared. So therefore, you have a mu squared over E squared term in the deep infrared. Now we can actually, and this is what we did in the recent essay, put this in the context of a, a cosmology and see why this is why this would be happening. So just take some cosmology, let's say like the uh, usual homogeneous and isotropic uh, solution, FRW, uh, characterized by some A, and then you rewrite the dispersion relation in terms of A, obviously there will be some rescalings of P's and P tildes, et cetera. Um, you will have to do some representation theory. There is an extension of the usual representation theory with um, other uh, um, Lorentz invariants, uh, P squared plus P tilde squared, P, P tilde, P tilde squared minus P squared, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, the usual mass uh, 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 is defined uh, compared to the, uh, um, 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 the sort of gauge invariant mass in a different way. The masses are essentially uh, M squared plus mu and M squared minus mu if you want. And then if you look at representation theory, there are various cases, but these are the sort of physically relevant case. And you find out that actually, if you go to A, uh, because of this rescaling of A, if you go to the early universe, P tilde modes are uh, active. You can call them dark modes or dual modes. If you go to the A, A tilde goes to infinity, P tilde goes to zero. So that's the late universe. And essentially you would be saying that this parameter mu is relevant for uh, the late universe where the dark matter modes are kind of frozen associated with P tilde, but there you could find this infrared effects essentially upon gravity. 
And we basically associate with neutrinos. You can put a bound on the new parameter, and it turns out it's uh, very close to the dark energy scale. You can also try to compute the static potential. There is a, uh, um, you know, you know that people do that in the uh, atrosh type of experiments. There is a correction to the, what you would associate with the Yukawa potential, which looks like this uh, Friedel potential, as people know, in condensed matter physics. This is a different spelling, not like Friedel. Uh, but anyway, a very famous thing in condensed matter physics. Anyway, um, if you include the uh, background fields, as I argued, you'll basically get extra fields. So let's say for the U1, you would have a photon, you would have a dark photon. But from the apart from the usual operators you would write for the effective action, let's say, of dark photon and, and the photon, you would have these terms that come out from essentially this very phase term. They completely gauge invariant. I just isolate a term which looks very strange <laughs> because you have to integrate over the board line parameter and they look non-local and definitely not captured by effective field theory because effective field theory would take lambda goes to zero. You can go to quantum gravity and make this uh, dynamical Born geometry. If you were just exactly do what you did for matter particle, uh, for the case of an extended object, like a string, you will get uh, this formulation of the string where now you generally have omega, eta, and h. Notice that, let's say in double field theory or something, omega is actually equal to zero. If you were to take omega equal to zero, integrate over x tilde, you would get the usual particle path integral. This is a bosonic, chiral, and non commutative double bosonic, chiral, and non commutative formulation. And in quantum gravity, basically what we've shown is that if you take the zero modes of the string, you actually exactly get to this meta particle. And the background space time of the string is not a usual space time, but exactly this modular space time. Also the observables are modular uh, variables and the uh, vertex operators look at exponents i, k, x is, and they do not have some call cycles. This is a common, maybe the string people in the audience could understand, but if not, forget about it. If you include, uh, let's say some uh, backgrounds like the, uh, Kalbermon field, um, essentially you can find out that there is an effective non commutativity with an explicit relative locality. This is an explicit case where X and L did the mix, mix in terms of a certain background, which is an anti-symmetric background, which in four dimensions, as you know, is dual to axions. Um, uh, you can also uh, 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 provide a different type of space-time non-commutativity, not for dual space-time. In that case, you have some effective non-commutative field theory, and then you can put a bound on the lambda, uh, which would be theta in the usual literature, which is around 10 TeV. But however, for varying beta background, the new background, which is sort of dual to the usual Calvermont background, uh, you will find also non-associativity. So you see there is some structure here, which is a generalized geometric structure, which essentially captures all of the various cases maybe that people have studied. This is in the case of closed strings. They have studied in open strings, on maybe double field theory, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we should not be afraid of non sensitivity that actually might be lurking behind the sort of uniqueness of the standard model group, as has been known for some time. And it's probably relevant now more than before. Uh, for some reason, I cannot move my uh, uh, cursor. Okay, sorry. Uh, and so um, uh, we can, now the, the, the point of view on quantum gravity is a little bit different. You were supposed to start from these modular cells and extensify, make the space time. So this is very, I think, natural for uh, people who worry about background independence and quantum gravity in general, right? From the string theory point of view, this is a new uh, point of view, right? Because you're not compactifying, you essentially extensify. Imagine a bosonic uh, 26 dimensional string completely compactified, but now you have a modular space time interpretation, no close time, a lot of loops, et cetera, et cetera. And then you build everything out of this. As we say, one dimensional modular space time essentially is, uh, looks from this point of view, two dimensional torus. Uh, you can also provide a non-perturbative quantum gravity thing, which might be related to this, uh, to this uh, matrix model that uh, Laurent mentioned from a completely different point of view. In other words, that modular wall sheet, you, you basically make wall sheet into modular. So now you have tau, sigmas, and tau tilde, tau sigma tilde. You Fourier transform the, the tilde tau and uh, tilde sigma, and you get some matrices. And as usual in matrix models, you replace the derivatives of sigma with uh, some uh, uh, commutators, and you get this matrix quantum uh, theory, but I'm not gonna say much, uh, uh, much about this. Now about dark matter and dark energy, as you know, we effectively have to tell something about these parameters, Einstein's equations, the lambda for the dark energy, or actually lambda over G Newton, that, that's uh, uh, cosmological constant over G Newton is really the vacuum energy, and the parts of the energy momentum tensor, which are not associated with visible, right, a standard model matter. 
Now, our general story would suggest that there is essentially a dual to the standard model of particle physics, as I was arguing before, but what about dark uh, energy? Well, let's say first about dark matter. To leading on lambda squared, we have essentially Hamiltonian, which we have a square root of GG tilde, lambda m plus lambda dm. This uh, lambda m would be standard model Lagrangian, and then we have a dual standard model Lagrangian. In principle, remember the excitations, there is some uh, correlation between because of that very phase, but let's treat the, the first order in lambda squared. And then if you integrate over dual space time, let's say there's a hidden variables in quantum mechanics, natural hidden variables in quantum mechanics, which might have to do with quantum measurement problem, et cetera. I, did, I didn't want to uh, dwell on that. You will get just an effective action in observed space time, which you have some extra degrees of freedom. And that's consistent with that picture that I was telling you about metaparticles and dispersion relation in cosmology and so forth. And essentially, there are some dark, natural dark sources. Now, these interesting dark matter sources are actually correlated to visible matter. Because remember, the particle there, P and P tilde, are correlated to this uh, non commutativity structure, in other words, the symplectic structure. Uh, but for that, you have to keep the uh, fundamental limit as finite. And now the interesting thing, uh, uh, I will not elaborate uh, here, but you can look at my papers with Doug Edmonds and Todd. So you can look at data from galaxies and clusters and globular clusters, and there's always a correlation of the observed, let's say acceleration, maybe dark, due to dark matter and baryonic matter and the baryonic acceleration. Now, people who usually do modify gravity and so forth would make a big deal about this, but in their case, they don't have dark matter. Here, the statement would be that if you had a metaparticle dark matter, you have a natural correlation to visible dark matter, a natural way to get to this universal acceleration, partially because the metaparticles are sensitive to these disparate scales, right? You had the mu and n and the lambda scale, so, uh, so it could be sensitive to Hubble scale, and that's precisely, as you know, what fits the observation, 10 to the minus 10 meters, uh, meters per second squared is essential acceleration scale associated with the dark energy with the scale. Now, what is the dark energy here? You just do exactly the same thing, just in the um, leading order lambda. So you have an R and R tilde. Uh, uh, again, you integrate over the dual uh, space time. You get a G Newton from the volume of space time. You, uh, you get from the integral of the curvature of the dual space time, you get a G Newton minus one lambda. That's the dark energy. You can actually uh, redo that by basically relating the dual volume and the space-time volume. This is something with uh, this discussion is something we've been doing with Tristan and Pear for the last couple of years, and get a non-extensive action, which essentially suggests that the scale of the cosmological constant you see is inversely proportional to the Planck scale. So it's natural in the sense that the Planck scale goes to infinity, it goes to zero, right? Kind of in a tough sense, natural. But the product of the two is some intermediate scale. Of course, if you were to plug the numbers, you know you would get a TV scale. So it would be interesting to do that, to understand this uh, more precisely. Here's a sketch of this argument that basically tells you why maybe vacuum energy would be naturally uh, suppressed because you have two scales, lambda and lambda tilde. So therefore you can naturally see so, and therefore you don't have to have a large dark energy scale, but actually naturally small uh, dark energy scale. This is again, consistent with infrared effects of monograph. You can talk about statistical effects, which I did with Tatsu and Vishnu Jijala and Mojkavich and relevance for the uh, fine structure of dark energy, uh, maybe new uh, approach to vacuum selection, et cetera. Anyway, so this is my summary. Um, you see, uh, we started from quantum mechanics via basically quantum uh, space-time. They discovered new structures like modular space-time, bond geometry, connection to relative locality. In the context of quantum field theory, uh, we found out uh, 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 that there are new uh, excitations, which could naturally capture uh, dark matter excitations correlated to the visible excitations. So presumably that's why there is a similar abundance between them, uh, uh, which uh, observations suggest. And then in quantum gravity, which is of course the frontier, we have a dynamical board geometry, but maybe again, connections to observations via dark matter, very particular dark matter, and very particular dark energy, which comes from the curvature of dual space time. The phenomenology, one of the messages is the quantum gravity phenol actually appears in the infrared, not only in the ultraviolet, the deformed dispersion relations in that context, there's also deformed scalar potential, dark matter correlate to visible matter and dark energy and dark energy cease. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark, for a nice talk. Uh, okay, are there questions? Okay, uh, can someone give?
Ja, hello. Uh, we had some difficulties here to, to hear uh, the beginning of your talk, which looks, uh, what you do looks very nice, actually. Uh, my difficulty, uh, we had actually a construction, a discretized construction uh, based on fuzziness, let's say, uh, non commutativity based on fuzziness. And one of uh, our problems. Uh, is how to deal with uh, representations uh, of uh, non-compact uh, groups. And here it seems that uh, somehow you don't uh, meet at all this problem. Uh, could you tell us why or lead us also to the same conclusion somehow? Well, I, okay, so the only thing, I, I don't know, maybe I will have to look at your paper. So uh, if you would be so kind to send me an email, I would really uh, enjoy uh, uh, looking at your yeah. paper, so maybe I could uh, uh, send you a more detailed answer by email. But from what I've understood, I mean, the most interesting thing here is that you see, this is not just a discretized things, but it's actually modular. So actually, when you look at the wave functions, for example, associated with these constructions, uh, you don't have this Gaussians, but because of the Zach transform, you have a natural mod uh, functions. We have a natural uh, transformations on the modular transformations, and those are the theta functions. So you see the space of the of the of the of the states. It's 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 a little bit different. So this is a very particular uh, 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 representation in which you see you can reconcile the fundamental length with uh, something like a continuous symmetry. Now some people, other people, I think Eugenio Bianchi and others are trying to do something like this by redefining what you mean by difference operator. But apparently, as far as I know, they don't encounter modular representation. So I cannot tell you about the uniqueness of this, but definitely um, uh, it exists. Uh, you can reconcile discreteness with continuous symmetries. and But you see, for that, you need this modular uh, representation. Okay, so that's the only thing I think I can answer now. But if you would send me an email, maybe I could give you a more technical this. Sorry? Methods, the modular representations. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I can say what. what okay, what, I've got the methods. I yeah, got why it. don't you maybe uh, send me an email and maybe we can answer? Thank you. Sorry, I, I can't no. hear you. Thank you. Are there more questions? Uh, Laurent, you had a comment. Maybe you want, want to make a comment now, Laurent. No, no, that's okay. If there's other questions. Okay. It, yeah, I just wanted to emphasize that by modular, what you're saying is that this non commutativity in space needs to be, you know, supplemented by what happens in momentum space. And it, yes, it, this is somehow what usually people miss in that. Uh, yeah, you see, it's double, right? Because it has also the momentum space. It's a doubling anyway. that happens because of non-commutativity, but it's not a doubling of degrees of freedom. It's more like a yes. rehashing of... It's chiral. It's chiral. So you have the same number of degrees of freedom. You don't double the degrees of freedom. Uh, okay. Are there more uh, questions? Okay. If not, let's thank uh, Jordi uh, again. Thank you. Um, okay, um, the next speaker uh, was supposed to be uh, Gordon Semenov, but he cancelled his participation. Uh, so we uh, go, uh, we skip to the next uh, speaker, who is uh, um, Mark uh, van Ramstonk, who will talk about uh, cosmology from uh, uh, confinement. Uh, Mark, I see that you are uh, there already. Um, We are just promoting you to panelists, so you should be able soon to uh, share your uh, slides. Okay, I see that Mark is now a panelist. Mark, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, great. Um, okay. Let you me share my slides. Screen. Okay. And can you see this? Not yet. Okay. Now we can see it, and uh, you can start whenever you are ready. Okay. Well, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, yeah, I have, apologize. I haven't been able to participate 
very much since uh, mostly it's in the time I'm sleeping, but uh, I'm glad to be able to talk and tell you a little bit about an approach to possibly describing cosmology in the context of ADS-CFT. So in the context of uh, our maybe best developed uh, approach to understanding quantum gravity. And so this is work uh, that's started a couple of years ago with uh, various people at UBC, as well as Brian Swingle. And, uh, and then I'll talk about um, some things that relate to more recent papers, including ongoing work with Brian Swingle and my student, Peter Simigida and uh, Stefano Antonini. And so I wanna ask the, the question. Uh, so this is, I think one of the big questions in, in theoretical high energy physics that remain is, is to come up with some fully microscopic model that describes uh, a big bang cosmology and ideally the one that we live in. And so one of the problems even though we've made a lot of progress understanding quantum gravity using ADS-CFT, it seems that the space times that we can easily describe using ADS-CFT, even though they can have lots of interesting things going on in the interior of the space time, black holes and all kinds of other matter if you want, uh, these space times are, are asymptotically, they're, they're boring. So all of these space times have some asymptotic region, which is empty. And this is not what we observe in our cosmological universe. In fact, it's one of the basic assumptions of cosmology that we have homogeneity and isotropy. And so at any time we expect that the universe at, at any location is filled with stuff. So there have been various ideas to take ADS-CFT and extend it to uh, a cosmological setting. So I'm gonna review a couple of those and then the approach that I'll describe actually involves in some sense, a combination of these ideas. So one approach that might make uh, cosmology appear in the context of ADS-CFT is to use the the Randall syndrome idea or the, the brain world cosmology kind of idea where even though your space time as a whole might be asymptotically boring, asymptotically empty, um, it may be possible that in fact, the four dimensional cosmological physics is localized somewhere away from that asymptotic boundary. So this is the idea that you might have some, some type of brain. Uh, the way I've drawn it here, you have an end of the world brain. It could also have something on the other side. And uh, so the idea would be maybe um, you, you can make use of this mechanism of gravity localization in certain space times with certain brains, then the observers on the brain might over long range of distance scales experience four dimensional gravity and so then the idea would be you could have some cosmological physics on this, on this brain and we wouldn't be necessarily aware of the, the fact that there are extra dimensions and the fact that there might be this asymptotically boring region which is um, whose geometry is related to the geometry of the underlying uh, dual field theory. So that's one, one possible idea for realizing cosmology in the context of uh, FDS CFT and many people have talked about this sort of thing in the past. Um, although uh, I think what, what was maybe missing from some of the earlier discussions was how to uh, how to make a microscopic um, description of this. An interesting thing uh, to mention in this context is that uh, the, the Big Bang can arise in an interesting way. So in in geometries that are dual to CFTs, if we have some high energy state of the CFT, we understand that this is typically dual to a black hole type space time with horizons and it might have singularities. And so in this context, the Big Bang could actually originate um, or it could, could be a singularity uh, that is actually the same as a, per a particular kind of black hole singularity. So the you see in this uh, in the space time diagram, the initial time in the brain evolution coincides with uh, a part of the black hole singularity. 
Another idea separate from that is that uh, maybe we could somehow use analytic continuation. And, and there, there have been various versions of this idea. So um, this Maldacena mouse cosmology with wormholes, the DSCFT idea, um, this holographic uh, co cosmology approach uses some type of analytic continuation. Um, so I wanna maybe focus on a slightly more specific one, which is uh, I think the closest to the idea of Maldacena and mouse. And that is that um, even though our observed cosmological space-time has no asymptotically ADS boundary, um, perhaps the analytically continued space-time, so, so perhaps uh, some, in some imaginary time direction, you might find asymptotically ADS boundaries. And so then in some way, perhaps uh, you could come up with some description um, of of physics in a space time with asymptotically ADS boundaries and then through some analytic continuation. So perhaps the, the cosmological physics lives on this other, this other um, sheet of, or this other analytic continuation of the full space time. Okay, so I, I'm now gonna describe a, a particular setup that I think might be able to realize cosmology and ADS CFT and it uses both of these ideas Okay, but in a somewhat different way than people have described in the past. So the idea is we're wanting to describe four-dimensional gravity with coupled to matter. And so what I want to do is start with some holographic three-dimensional CFT. So this, this is going to be uh, a CFT whose gravity dual is ADS4 times some internal space, or maybe it's a warped product. And I will, for the purposes of this talk, be focusing on the case where this CFT lives just in Minkowski space. And this is going to be related to the fact that ultimately I'm going to try to describe flat space cosmology. If, if we wanted to describe a closed universe eventually, then I would be considering this CFT on a sphere. Um, but since we observe uh, uh, to a good approximation that our universe is flat, uh, I'll consider this case. And so, well, clearly this is not, uh, not a, a good model of cosmology because it's, it's just ordinary ADS CFT. So we can have different states of this and there would be different interesting things in the interior here. But again, this is an example where your space time would be asymptotically empty. Okay, so what I wanna do is somehow uplift this picture. So somehow uplift the, the uh, ADS geometry here to an FRW spacetime. And I'm going to do that in uh, kind of a different way. Uh, so from, from the microscopic perspective, what I'm going to do is actually can introduce a, a separate uh, copy of this three-dimensional CFT. Uh, this is going to be not exactly the same thing, but uh, in some sense, the mirror image of, of this original CFT. Uh, in a way that I'll describe shortly. So I introduced the second copy of the original CFT, and then I introduce a coupling between these two. Um, so the coupling is going to be through some four-dimensional field theory, which may or may not be holographic. So if I just had the two copies of the pair of uh, 3D CFTs, that would describe two separate four-dimensional asymptotically ADS spacetimes. But I, what I want to argue is that if I, if I couple these, then in some circumstances, uh, these, these two copies of the asymptotically ADS spacetimes uh, could actually join in the interior uh, in a picture or something like this. Okay. So, so I'm going to argue that in some cases, this kind of setup would be dual uh, to a picture like this. And for this argument, it's it's simplest at the start if we imagine that this four-dimensional CFT is also holographic. Uh, and so in that case, there would be some five-dimensional space-time, but then at, at the edges of that uh, would, would be our um, this, this region that's effectively described by the four-dimensional physics. And um, what I'm going to argue is that is that, that region, um, which, which is maybe some kind of geometrical end-of-the-world brain, um, that thing can can join up um, so that 
so that we just have this one, um, one connected 4D space time here. Okay, so why why should we uh, why should we think this connects up? Okay. So first, I want to think about that just from uh, a field theory point of view. So so on the gravity side, what happens in the interior of the space time? What happens deep in the interior? That's a question about the infrared physics of the field theory. And what is this field theory? So we started with really these two 3D field theories coupled by a 4D uh, field theory. But at low energies, at large distance scales, what we're talking about is going to be some infrared three-dimensional physics. Okay, so at large distance scales, we're not going to notice this length scale between the two uh, 3D theories. And so the, the low energy physics is some kind of 3D uh, quantum field theory. And because we've introduced a scale, it, it won't necessarily be a conformal field theory. And in fact, what I would say is that generically, um, when, when, we, when we come up with some UV description of, of a 3D field theory, that maybe we expect the infrared physics is gapped, mm -hmm. that maybe coming ending up on some special conformal fixed point would, would be um, not the generic expectation. More generally, if, if for example, we, uh, we, we break um, all of the supersymmetry, so this is why I was saying that these, these two um, superconformal field theories are not, um, are, are not exactly the same. They're, they're sort of mirror images so that they preserve different supersymmetries uh, and the entire construction is not supersymmetric. Uh, then we might expect uh, a more generic bit, uh, physics for the infrared. So if, if it's true, if we, if we come up with a model like this, where you know, in the UV, it looks like two coupled uh, CFTs, but in the IR, the, the physics is gapped or, or confining. Um, then, then on the gravity side, that means that the radial direction has some finite extent. So this is true in, in various models of holographic QCD. And one natural way for that to happen is, as I mentioned before with this picture, that the, the, these end of the world brains, these regions that have a, a four dimensional effective description uh, join up with each other. Okay, so this is uh, this is the proposal that this happens in in some cases, and I wanted to mention this constraint, uh, this this condition that I put at the top. So, in terms of our construction later on to describe four D cosmology, it's going to be very important, um, as I mentioned in the early slides, to actually localize gravity, so um, so that the effective description is really four dimensional and not five dimensional. And the way that we're going to ensure that is to make sure that the 4D CFT that we introduce to couple the two theories has relatively few degrees of freedom. So in some ways, it's a small perturbation to the original physics, which was dual to 4D gravity. We have this small perturbation. And so we expect that still to a good approximation, uh, the, the, the physics dual to these 3D theories is some 4D gravity theory um, nevertheless, even though it's a, it's a sort of small perturbation, we know that small perturbations can lead uh, in quantum field theory to some long RG flow that eventually gives you very different physics in the infrared. So that's the, that's the picture of what's going on here. Um, uh, another piece of evidence, so, <clears throat> so for, for this picture of, of the end of the world brain joining up, uh, another piece of evidence is that this whole construction is very closely related to something that we understand well in the context of ADS-CFT. And that is the following picture. So instead of imagining the, the 4D theory with two boundary CFTs, what I could do is study a probe version of that, where instead of boundaries, I just introduce defects. So I could imagine a 4D CFT like N equals four super Yang Mills theory and then a pair of two plus one dimensional defects. And I could ensure that both of those defects uh, preserve supersymmetry, but they're, uh, they're defects of, in some sense, the opposite orientation, so that the supersymmetry preserved by each one is different. Okay. Now, for particular kinds of, of defects in, um, in particular supersymmetric holographic theories, we understand the bulk physics very well. 
And it's the physics of a probe brain um, in the ADS space time that's dual to the 4D CFT. When we have the defects of the opposite orientation, that means we have a brain coming out of one defect and an antibrain coming out of the other defect. And then instead of just continuing on into the bulk, what happens is that the, the probe brain and the probe antibrain, they prefer to join up. So there is another solution where they don't join up, but it's unstable. And so in, in, this, uh, in this case where we look at the opposite orientation defects, then you get a picture that's a probe version of the thing that I'm proposing. Okay. So this is another motivation that now instead of, if instead of these defects, well, I could, I could have defects that correspond to having more brains. And then there's some, I could think about interfaces where the rank of the gauge group changes across the defect. And then I could go all the way to this case where in fact, there is nothing on the other side. And the argument is maybe the, maybe the physics of this brain antibrain reconnection is still preserved even though now on the gravity side, we don't have a probe brain, but rather some geometrical end of the world brain. Okay, so going forward, um, I will assume that there exist examples of holographic theories of this sort on the left that are dual to something um, on the right that looks like this. And so again, I'll remind you that we don't necessarily have a geometrical interpretation for, for the physics inside. So in the cases where the 4D CFT had say a very small central charge, uh, that, that would correspond to some highly curved, um, possibly stringy region in the middle. And in that case, the, the region that ha would have a good description in terms of 4D, um, in terms of um, classical gravity would just be this 4D end of the world brain. Okay, so let's, let's look at the geometry that we've managed to construct. And I'm going to focus on this effective description of, of the physics on this red end of the world brain region. So I've preserved two plus one dimensional Poincare invariants. And so in that case, the four dimensional metric should only depend on one coordinate, which is the coordinate that goes from one asymptotically ADS region um, to the other, or from, from, from one side here to the other. And so if we write down the metric for that kind of geometry, well, it looks like this. So one way to write it down would be to introduce this tau direction that goes from, from one boundary to the other. And so it looks like some kind of a wormhole with two asymptotically ADS regions. So now you can probably see the relevance to cosmology this is just a, a double analytically continued FRW spacetime. Okay. So what we want to do now, assuming that we can make this construction, is to think about some double analytic continuation on the gravity side, and then understand what does that mean on the field theory side. So if I take this geometry and I, I just, analytically continue the tau direction and the z direction, which is just one of the, one of the directions, sort of the time direction in the original picture. So I analytically continue those two directions. Well, then my geometry on the end of the world brain is just FRW. And in the double analytically continued picture, this end of the world brain generally doesn't make it to the asymptotic region. Okay. So in this picture, you could have some end of the world brain with localized gravity, with a cosmological metric, and it wouldn't at any place connect with the asymptotic region of this, uh, of this space time. Okay, so it, it's more like the, the first picture uh, that I described uh, where we're realizing some kind of brain world cosmology in, uh, in the context of ADS CFT. Okay, but we want to understand what, what is the relevance of this space time. If I do a double analytic continuation on the gravity side, what does that mean on the field theory side? What, what sort of um, thing is dual to that? And so the, the answer to that is that we, so we can think of, of one analytic continuation of, of this field theory 
that would give us some Euclidean field theory with two 3D CFTs and a 4D CFT and everything would be Euclidean. And then the second analytic continuation, uh, what the way to interpret that is that you're going to slice that Euclidean path integral and think of it as, think of the path integral as generating a state of the theory at this middle time. And that state is going to be the state that's dual to this space time. So let me expand on that. So, so to make it more clear, okay, so the claim is that I could set up some Euclidean path integral, which is going to generate a particular state of a 4D CFT. So notice here are physical degrees of freedom do not include the 3D CFT at all. The physical degrees of freedom are just this four dimensional CFT, which might not, not even be a conventionally holographic theory. But we're going to make use of the 3D CFT in order to generate an interesting state. So the wave functional for this state of the 4D theory is going to be an integral over all the possible Euclidean field configurations of the 4D CFT fields and the Euclidean 3D CFT fields weighted by the, uh, the action for this coupled theory. Okay, so this, this describes the wave functional for a particular state of the Lorentzian 4D CFT. Okay, and so, so then if you ask, what is, the, what is the gravity dual of that state? Well, in order to find that, you would find the geometry dual to this doubled path integral and then you would analytically continue it. Okay. So this is, this is kind of- Five minutes left. Yeah, just please. Oh, so you have a question? No, uh, you have five minutes left for your talk. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so um, yeah, so let me spend the last five minutes on some of the consequences of this. Okay, so this, just to make sure you understand um, what we're saying is that this particular this, this picture now refers to a Euclidean path integral where uh, some integral over this, this 3D CFT is involved in constructing a very interesting, um, say high energy state of our 4D theory. And we're saying that this state is dual to this, this geometry here, um, which, has our, uh, which has our 4D cosmology on the end of the world brain. Okay, okay so if, if this all works, then the construction would give um, some fully microscopic non-perturbative description of, of cosmological physics in four dimensions. We don't know if that would be relevant to our own cosmology, but even if not, I think it'd be very interesting uh, just because it seems to be so difficult to actually come up with uh, non-perturbative descriptions uh, when you don't have these asymptotically ADS regions or asymptotically empty regions. So I'll end with just a few comments about this, uh, about interesting features of this construction. Um, so one comment is that we started out with uh, uh, a symmetry, like kind of, kind of a reflection symmet symmetric field theory. And in the end, that symmetry translates to the fact that um, in the Lorentzian picture, these constructions are going to give rise to some time symmetric scale factors. So the types of things that we can describe are like big bang, big crunch cosmologies, or perhaps, perhaps uh, some kind of cyclic cosmology. And so what that means is, well, if it is relevant to our own universe, um, then there would have to be some kind of uh, turnaround point in the future where our universe would start uh, contracting again. Okay. And of course, this is, this is certainly possible. It's not in conflict with any observations, we see that currently our universe seems to be accelerating. Uh, but in some cases, if if the um, if the vacuum energy were actually time dependent um, in some way, then it could eventually go negative, and then we could in fact could have some kind of a crunch. Um, another comment is that in terms of the physics of the cosmology, really everything should be determined. Uh, once we choose these field theories. So there weren't really any other inputs into the physics other than 
saying, what is my 3D field theory and what is my 4D field theory and how are they coupled? And so in particular, uh, we, we even have some guidance for uh, which 3D field theories we would wanna choose. So if, if we were trying to actually model something that's phenomenologically relevant, we would want the effective field theory on this end of the world brain to look something like um, so something like the standard model or some beyond the standard model physics. And we have some control over that in this setup uh, because for example, the global symmetries of this 3D CFT correspond to the gauge symmetries that live on the, um, on the, in the 4D gravity. And so if, if we wanted to get a particular gauge group, we just have to choose a 3D CFT with uh, that certain global symmetry. Another comment is that the, the so we, we have these two pictures, the cosmology picture, and then the double analytically, double analytically continued picture dual to the confining gauge theory. And an interesting point is that the stress energy tensor in the cosmology, that should be double analytically continued to some stress energy tensor in this other picture. But in the other picture, we were talking about a static geometry. The time direction was, was a separate direction that we didn't draw. And so the interpretation of this stress energy tensor in the other case would actually be some vacuum stress energy tensor for the field theory with these two asymptotically ADS boundaries. And so if we wanted to understand the evolution of the energy density in cosmology, we could actually first just study this vacuum energy problem it would be like a Casimir energy kind of calculation, but looking at the spatial dependence, and then we would double analytically continue that. And, uh, and that would be how we would um, deduce our, our energy density evolution in the cosmology. Okay. So similarly, um, if, we, if we wanted to understand something like the CMB from this microscopic uh, setting, well, the, the CMB we could understand say from correlation functions of the stress energy tensor in our cosmology. And these would be related through analytically, uh, analytic continuation to just vacuum correlation functions of the stress energy tensor in this other model. Okay. So, uh, so it's interesting to, I think very interesting to study uh, these kind of, this anal double analytically continued picture, which is the dual of some confining gauge theory and ask if it's possible um, through this procedure to maybe reproduce um, observations or predictions of inflation. Okay, so that's all I have uh, and thanks for listening. That's very interesting talk. Questions? Karthin Gorfu. Yeah, George has... Uh, hello. Uh, well, uh, I think I got the main uh, points of your construction. Uh, I wonder uh, concerning physics, uh, uh, to what uh, uh, will break the n equal four eventually? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. So, um, right. Let's go. Yeah. So let's go back to. So let's let's talk about this picture, and let me say I didn't really talk about microscopic constructions, but let me let me talk about a, a specific one. Now, um, probably we probably we don't want to start with uh, n equals four super Yang mills, but nevertheless we understand it well. So so let me imagine that this four D CFT is n equals four super Yang mills theory, and so in that case, if we want to choose the three D theory to preserve supersymmetry, um, then there's a whole set of possible choices that were understood by Gato and Witten. Uh, so there are all these possible boundary theories that you can couple. Um, from string theory, the construction would be you have D3 brains, and then they can end on stacks of D5s and NS5s in some way, and then you could have extra D3 brains stretched between the five brains. So there's this way to construct uh, 3D superconformal field theories that can be coupled to the n equals four theory uh, in such a way to preserve supersymmetry. And then on the other side, what we can do, so the string construction makes it easiest to understand. So we have some D3 brains 
their their endings on d5s and anti d and sorry d5s and ns5s and then on the other side we can imagine um, a field theory that corresponds to um, anti brains so we could we could have these d3 brains ending on uh, the anti brain versions of of the of the first boundary condition okay so the simplest would be like d3 stretched between d5 and anti d5 and so in that way you pres you sort of preserve the supersymmetry locally but then you break the supersymmetry through the, this choice of boundary conditions. And the reason that I wanna do that is that, uh, so let me go back to this picture with, with the stress energy sensor. Um, so in some way, I, th I, I feel like it's important to uh, not break the supersymmetry too harshly uh, because, because here, um, you know, in the cosmology picture, we have this cosmological constant problem. And the, the problem there is that naively the stress energy tensor, if you thought about vacuum um, uh, contributions from the quantum fields, naively that would be the completely the wrong order of magnitude. Okay. And similarly in this picture, um, you know, naively uh, you would compute vacuum uh, fluctuations and you'd get a stress energy tensor, which is not the right order of magnitude. But if, if we had some underlying supersymmetric theory, and the supersymmetry is only broken by, um, by these sort of in incompatible boundary conditions. Uh, and then I go to compute the stress energy tensor here in this picture. Uh, well, in that case, you might say that uh, the, the natural value for that stress energy tensor, uh, the, the scale would be set by the, the distance between these boundaries. Um, so be because the, the, the distance from one side to the other is, is the scale of supersymmetry breaking. Um, and that sort of scale is like the size of, I mean, that's like the size of the whole universe in this picture. And so, and so that could give uh, maybe even the right scale for the, the energy density um, in, in terms of um, this picture. And then hopefully in this side, it helps to like re resolve this cosmological constant puzzle. Okay, just, uh, well, I, I feel that this uh, long way till you have a realistic picture. Uh, just let me remind you that uh, in the best case, you would like to end up to n equal one uh, supersymmetry, right? Yeah, that's right. So so I, I think um, it's probably not a good idea to start with uh, the n equals four theory here. Um, in fact, so I, th I think in some ways, the, the most likely starting point would be some 3D theory so the other, the other thing we have to worry about is, um, you know, we, we don't want, um, if, if we start with too much supersymmetry, we're gonna have extra dimensions, uh, which are, are generally gonna be too large. Um, so so, so if, if we thought about an example, people have recently discussed um, ways to have 3D theories with supersymmetry, which are dual to 4D theories with some scale separation. So I think, in terms of a starting point, that might be the the best thing if, if one can understand those sorts of theories. Um, I'm, I'm referring to work of McAllister et al., um, where, where they they claim to find examples of uh, of ADS solutions in string theory where where the internal spaces have um, have a size that's parametrically suppressed relative to the ADS scale. Uh, so I'm thinking those things would have uh, 3D conformal field theories duels with uh, with much less supersymmetry. Or, or sorry, with with uh, sort of minimal supersymmetry, uh, and then if we had um, those coupled together through some forty CFT with with maybe n equals one, um, that that would have a better chance of being realistic. By the way, I completely agree that we're 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 far, it's a it's a fantasy to think that uh, you know this could give some realistic cosmology, but it's it's probably it's it's the motivation, so it's good to keep it in mind. Hey, thanks. Next, there is a uh, Hi, hi, Mark. It was a nice talk. <laughs> Thanks. But uh, I just wanted uh, I, uh, this picture of having two theories and in some sense talking to each other. Yes. So a um, uh, long time ago, before all these efforts, right, uh, with, with Jan and, and Vijay, we suggested that there should be really these two guys in the context of the sitter. So I know you started more with this uh, wormhole picture and then uh, did the uh, 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 double wick rotation and so forth. We were driven by, by symmetries uh, and relations between whatever Lorentzian, the sitter, and Euclidean anti-the-sitter. 
and some mathematical structures there and examples in, in three dimensions in turn Simons, what happens there. But, but anyway, the, the, the ending story was really that you have two theories and they're kind of entangled. Now, the picture that we had at the time was more like a BCS picture, um, you know, kind of Cooper pairing type of picture mm -hmm. that you have two conformal field theories and then you write the operators, which are the analog of what you would write in the BCS picture. And yes, you do get a gap equation, and the issue is really about the scales, uh, because uh, you know you have you have to have to sort of lambda natural. Now, uh, you I think I also like this, your suggestion. I don't know if you worked it out or something that as long as lambda is such so that it's inversely proportional to let's say some short distance scale, or exponentially, you know, uh, you, know you can rewrite it as some exponential formula. Uh, then you know, as the as you remove sort of the as you move the scale up, then of course lambda goes to zero. And then if you could have actually a supersymmetric theory, then that provides for sort of naturally small lambda. But I think the problem was always: is the universe going to be empty? In other words, how do you get matter? Uh, because you know you can get an empty maybe the sitter universe. In your case, that would be this a exponential. I know you have something more general in mind, like FRW and whatnot. But I mean, uh, do you get a universe which is full, not <laughs> empty? Yeah. Yeah. So let me let me mention that. Um, okay. Good. So I, I think there's matter. Uh, in, in fact, okay. So let's let's talk about this picture. Um, so I guess the thing to keep in mind is that we we we're constructing in in this final Lorentzian picture. We're constructing some very high energy state of uh, of our of our four D CFT. So, so this you this picture you should think of as being like a CFT version of like the Hartle Hawking kind of um, wave yeah. function of the universe. It's yeah, just happening in the CFT. Yeah. And then on the gravity side, uh, so you know we're we're very far from some vacuum physics. We've we've got the physics of you know we're talking talking if there's a five D um, gravity picture description, we're talking about the physics of this end of the world brain, but it's on the inside of a black hole and, and it's emerging from some black hole singularity. And so um, I think even in effect, even in the effective field theory description, um, you, you would sort of understand it as something like a, a Hartle Hawking um, path integral um, that constructs a state of this field theory, which is not the vacuum state. Um, uh, so I, I think I could draw a similar picture in the effective field theory to understand what sort of matter I would have at at the uh, at the turning point. Um, and basically, just because there's this uh, there's this boundary condition at some finite earlier time, uh, that means that you've got stuff. And uh, you know, only only if this tau zero went all the way to uh, minus infinity would would the thing be empty. So it's it's making use of Hartle Hawking kind of ideas to to. Fill, fill the universe with some amount of stuff. Okay, yeah, that also is uh, something we kind of had in mind, but uh, it's very kind of hard to work out the detail. I think the devil here is in the details, but anyway, uh, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, Beta, I, I, thanks for reminding me of your, I, now that you say it, I remember these, yeah. I guess that was in the DSCFT comments on, area. Uh, comments on the Sitter holography, I think that's the one where you yeah. will find this entangled Great. picture, etc. Anyway, okay, very nice, thank you. Uh, as I don't see any further questions, and we are also running out of time, I would suggest to thank uh, uh, Mark again and uh, also all the speakers of this uh, last session of this workshop. Um, and now, before uh, uh, giving the word to um, George Stupanos, um, so Mark, can you stop sharing? I can share uh, my so uh, screen. We are. We are at the end uh, of this uh, nice workshop. Uh, first of all, uh, we should remember our uh, beloved uh, friend, collaborator, teacher, and pioneer of no commutativity, uh, John Mador. Uh, all together, I think uh, we had a, a, an excellent uh, a meeting, which of course was uh, limited uh, by the fact of uh, Pandemia, so I feel we were here only one third or so, uh, or 40 percent of the participants, and uh, this is really uh, a limitation which uh, hopefully we will overcome uh, next year. So, we had some discussions already with uh, uh, members of the organizing committee how 
uh, to deal with that the next year and uh, certainly we will encourage people uh, to to be in person <laughs> not online uh, this is uh, one point uh, then there are discussions uh, if it should be very general uh, or not uh, probably will be as general as uh, this year uh, you see we had an old agreement among us that uh, we will uh, hold here every second year a uh, non-commutative uh, workshop general enough and um, from this point of view to have the same thing next year it will be a little bit uh, strange or odd but uh, uh, Paolo Ascari reminded us that uh, this is only postponement of last year so it's a little bit justified to have the same thing uh, next year so anyway it's a discussion uh, uh, which uh, is among us but uh, certainly you are very welcome to contribute and uh, tell us your opinions. So uh, from our side, I would like to <clears throat> thank all the organizers, uh, all the speakers, of course, all the chairs, <laughs> in particular, Alessia, <laughs> the car is still the last uh, moment. And of course, uh, our friends here, uh, George, uh, Stratos, uh, uh, Stelios, and uh, of course, uh, Iphigenia, who is always uh, here. And of course, I don't forget my friend uh, Costas, who was the sto cornerstone of everything. Without him, we could not really uh, do anything. So have a nice uh, and safe trip back. And uh, thank you for your participation. And let's thank all organizers, including Zorzo, again.